coming up on lawmakers. Legislation that fails to pass the chamber of its origination could be dead for the session on this crossover day. We'll have some highlights. The House engages in contentious debate over Speaker Glenn Richardson's peach care fix. And the Senate votes to limit the use of lottery proceeds to the Hope Scholarship and pre-K programs. Those stories and more are coming up next. This is Lawmakers, your source for all the news from under the Gold Dome. Here are your anchors, and Wandy Lawson and David Zelsky. Good evening at this hour. The House and Senate remain in session on this legislative day 30. The Senate, in fact, just came in from their dinner break. Okay, it's been a long day already. In all likelihood, this session is not going to come to an end for many, many hours to come. Also on tonight's program, city redevelopment strategies and creating townships. Well, the House today votes to urge the Senate to consider the supplemental budget, but our first story tonight, the debate over proposed peach care fix. House Speaker Glenn Richardson today led the passage of a sweeping revision of the Peach Care Insurance Program. House Bill 340 moves peach care eligibility from 235% of the federal poverty level to 200%, authorizes the Board of the Department of Community Health to set the income cap between 185% and 225% of poverty. It grandfathers current peach care recipients, requires alignment to the state employee health plans, and makes vision and dental care optional for an additional cost. It also requires the Department of Community Health to verify the income and citizenship of all applicants. Currently, the department verifies a sample of applications. This is designed to keep the poorest of the poor with health insurance. We ran into a jam. We were insuring anybody and everybody that could get on the line and get signed up. Until a couple of weeks ago, when you went on to the site, it asked if you wanted it in English or Spanish. And if you hit Spanish, it said bienvenidos. Now, I don't know about you, but the people that I know in the state of Georgia are tired. They're tired of working to pay for health insurance for people who are illegally within the United States of America and cannot speak the language. And it is time that we put some restraints on this program to bring it in conformity with what the people of Georgia want to do. Speaker Richardson drew opposition from House Democrats who questioned whether this plan is actually intended to phase out the peach care program. We formed a bipartisan group to go to Washington. I know there was a group about to go, but when you got there with this new Congress, wasn't a whole lot of folks to go see that could help us. So we've tried to make this a nonpartisan effort to look after children's health care as our first priority. But folks, by changing the threshold, it makes this issue unfortunately partisan. We lobbied the members of Congress in a very bipartisan fashion, met with the members of all committees of jurisdiction, all committees, in Speaker Nancy Pelosi's conference room. It was arranged by Congressman Sanford Bishop, and there were approximately 15 congressional people in the audience at the table, including the chairman of the subcommittee of authorization for peach care, who told us that they would do everything within their power. The only thing that I know that's partisan is the Congress that says they're going to fund this, put the funding with language on an Iraqi war resolution telling our president when troops would come out. If that's not partisanship, I don't know what is. And that was not me. If they really wanted to fund this, they would have just done it. But they wanted to use it as a little football. So if we're talking about playing games, we know who's playing the game. And it starts at the Speaker's office in Washington, D.C. The House passed HB 340-101 to 63 with one amendment compelling DCH to offer the dental and vision option. If adopted by the Senate and signed by the governor, the new regulations would take effect June 1st. Legislation that creates infrastructure development districts passed the Senate today. However, the resolution which puts this on the ballot for the people to vote originally failed to receive the two-thirds vote needed to pass. Senate Resolution 309 was then reconsidered and brought back to the floor around 5.30 p.m. where it passed on the second try. Senator Johnny Grant sponsors both Senate Bill 200 and Senate Resolution 309 and began the debate this morning. IDDs are a tool that should be available for our cities and counties to use. 
It may not be the right tool for every ap application, but it should be one of the tools available. And then we should leave the use of this tool to local concerns and needs. An IDD can be a benefit to a cash-strapped local government because it encourages the private sector to finance infrastructure that would normally be paid for by existing taxpayers. Since the IDD board is issuing the bonds, a local government's credit rating and bonding capacity is not affected. Forming an IDD requires 100% participation from the landowners in a proposed district, and it requires local government approval. Landowners develop a formal petition to the local government that lays out all basic infrastructure development plans. These plans have to adhere to all zoning, environmental, and development requirements. Once an IDD is created, a governing board oversees the build-out and manages the finances of the district. The initial board is appointed by the landowners creating the district. As the development progresses, seats on the board come up for election and residents vote for the candidates. Senator Doug Stoner then proposed an amendment which creates a study committee that could further examine this process over the next year. He says there are problems in Senate Bill 200's IDD formula. This issue is a complex issue. And as he mentioned before, the CIDs, we've gone back and made changes over the years. And I see no rush in doing this bill in the sense since we do have time for another session to perfect it, in my opinion. And so that's the reason for the study committee. Just give us time. Let's take a look at it. And let's be back here next session and correct this. Now, after another 30 minutes of debate, which began around 5.30 p.m., Senate Resolution 309 passed 40 to 13 without Senator Stoner's amendment. And now both SB 200 and SR 309 go to the House. However, in between this morning and this afternoon's debates, some behind-the-scenes maneuvering occurred, which brought another bill into the mix. Lawmakers Jesse Freeman is live at the Capitol to explain. Jesse. Well, David, the debate today was as fierce as any in the Senate this year, and it focused on a strategical move to get SR 309 through. Now, Senator David Edelman wants to allow communities to create townships in Georgia. Those are basically planning districts with limited taxing power. Senator Johnny Grant was able to table Edelman's resolution, but the Senate minority leader blamed it on the Senate leadership. The constitutional amendment that's the subject of the resolution has gotten caught up in a little bit of politics. There's uh, no opposition that's been voiced to me with the content of the resolution. Uh, but I understand this is a political process, and I look forward uh, to work, continuing to work in a bipartisan way to pass it. The heavy-handed move that we just saw here a few minutes ago with tabling one of my members' bills and coupling this bill with another member's bill in order to try to get it passed, I find unconscionable. I'm very disappointed that it was pointed out that somehow we uh, have tied this, this bill to another resolution. Uh, I certainly have not been involved in that. If a senator moves to move a bill, he did it on his own accord. I had no intention to have a conversation about this bill and to go straight to the votes, but the leader of our caucus just had his integrity in question from the well of this body. And since we want to talk about the policy behind the bill, I'll take the majority leader up on that conversation. Candidly, there are several problems with this bill. You can start off by asking why is there only one public hearing call for in the bill? Motions are running very, very high on this issue. I want to apologize to the Senate that our conduct has not been as civil as I know many of us would like. We will rise above this situation and we will move on. Now, both resolutions eventually passed. The township resolution vote was 43 to 4. The legislation now heads over to the House where that body will get a chance to review the measure that could slow down the rapid rate of municipalization that has occurred, especially around Metro Atlanta. Reporting live, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. Thank you, Jesse. Well, one week after passage, the House today sent the supplemental budget to the Senate for consideration, but not before taking a stand against Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle's contention that the budget is loaded with pork projects. House business began with Appropriations Chair Ben Harbin withdrawing a notice of a motion that the House reconsider its action in passing House Bill 94. This House has passed a budget that the people of Georgia can be proud of. There's money in there for indigent care. Our hospitals, we talk about a trauma care network, and it started, I think, that debate in the Senate. 
We talk about a building a trauma care network, yet we're wanting to take away the money that's in this budget to support those trauma care facilities that are here today. We've already lost one. Are they wanting to lose the rest? We talk about being in favor of charter schools, untying the hands of those local administrators and allowing them to improve the education in their communities through charter schools. This budget includes $5 million for charter schools. That argument about charter schools, quite frankly, started in the Senate a few days ago or a few months ago. I guess what you could say is with all those Senate discussions about doing things, the House has actually done them. We are putting this budget's money where the Senate's mouth is. I don't get to vote except in limited situations, but I'm going to ask unanimous consent. Anyone object to me voting? Okay. I voted. On the gentleman's motion, the yeas are 162, the nays zero. The House has immediately transmitted House Bill 94 to the Senate. I would ask the clerk to dispatch someone with staff to hand deliver that and ask them to begin work. Now, this largely symbolic vote means that the Senate receives the budget with a note that urgent attention is required attached to it. Well, of all the bills passed today, there were numerous controversial measures that were left off the calendar on this crossover day and are therefore dead for this session. Lawmaker Sandra Parrish has more on those bills. Sandra. In Wadi, among the most controversial bills this session is one to allow alcohol sales on Sundays. After much debate in committee and polls released by both sides of the issue, Senate Bill 137 was left off today's calendar. Senate Rules Committee Chair Don Balfour says the bill by Senator Seth Harf was likely to fail anyway, and he didn't want to take away time from other important measures. Sunday sales was one that we debated for a while whether to put it on or not. Some folks really wanted, some folks didn't. Uh, we had a vote last week on uh, alcohol and limousines. Uh, that went down to the feet, and I think that was a foreshadowing of uh, a bill that, if we had put it on the floor for today, would have been on the floor for an hour, hour and a half, and eventually was going to go down to the feet anyhow, and then therefore killing 20 or 30 other bills. My philosophy has been all along, this would probably take more than one year to get the process through. Uh, every time the legislature has addressed one of these issues, it's taken multiple years for it to happen. Two bills by Senator Vincent Ford that would have stiffened the penalties for hate crimes and made it tougher for police to get no-knock warrants were also left off the calendar and appear dead this session. Those were very controversial bills in some respects. Uh, uh, the, the arguments are, 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 are wide and broad. Uh, we thought in the end they probably weren't going to pass either, so we decided not to put them on that someone would say that the too controversial is, is an affront to, you know, to the people of the state of Georgia. They send us down here to do the hard work to make the tough decisions, to make tough calls. And a measure to officially designate April as Confederate Heritage Month also failed to make it to crossover day. Senator Jeff Mullis sponsored Senate Bill 284. It came uh, a pretty hot potato, so to speak, and controversial. Uh, uh, attention and uh, the rules chairman thought we need to perhaps find some middle ground and add some more information on there about the history that would include uh, slavery and the uh, underground train and uh, that's fine with me we're going to work to, uh, to overcome some of our shortfalls and, and you'll see this coming back probably next session and you may see all these bills again next year since all made it out of committee reporting live I'm Sandra Parrish for lawmakers Thank you, Sandra. Another bill that died on the floor of the House today is HB 163 that would have brought payday lenders back into Georgia after the legislature outlawed them three years ago. The House reconsidered its vote from last Tuesday after the measure failed to receive the 91 votes needed to pass. House members debated the bill more than two hours last week. I just don't believe that the average loan of about 300, 300 or 242 dollars with no security attached to it. It's going to cause anybody to lose their home or lose their car, but I do believe when you force people to go to even worse alternatives, then you face a problem down the road. There are worse ways to borrow money in Georgia and worse people to get it from. Please remember, if the people that are fighting in Iraq is exempted, ladies and gentlemen, from this bill, they are exempted. That is no coincidence. This is not good legislation. 
and we ought not to be putting this legislation on our constituents. They are also the same families whose children are in the military. And so I ask you to do not step back, back in the past, and put this unbelievable load on the people that sent you down here to protect them. Today, when the bill was reconsidered, it again failed to receive enough votes. As debate continues tonight, the Senate may take up Senator Emanuel Jones' bill that would make Georgia's most recent sex offender law retroactive. The bill could free Gennarlo Wilson, the 18-year-old who now sits in state prison for aggravated child molestation. The bill is near the bottom of the Senate calendar, and some Republicans, such as Senate President Pro Tem Eric Johnson, may vote to defeat it or never even hear it. Senate Bill 37 would propose to reopen 1,100 sexual predators' case and, and move them out of jail and potentially onto the streets of Georgia. I'm really excited that the bill made its way to the calendar. Of course, I'm a little bit discouraged because, you know, we have a pretty full calendar today, uh, and my bill is the second to the last. So we're going to be here for a while. I brought my sleeping bag. I plan to be camping out here until my bill gets brought to the floor. So it's uh, second to last on a long calendar. Our intent is to work the calendar. It just depends on whether we can get to it um, uh, before the end. We don't even have to stop on midnight on day 30. So um, if the Senate's willing to work, we'll work all the way through it. Now it is a common practice for the Senate leadership to place controversial bills at the foot of the calendar and then vote to adjourn before they are taken up. Governor Purdue claimed a victory today when a long fought for piece of legislation passed the state Senate today. Lawmakers Bridget Snap is live at the Capitol with that story. Bridget. David, third time could be the charm for the governor's Hope Chest Amendment, which finally passed the Senate this afternoon by a vote of 45 to 8. If passed by the House, the constitutional amendment would give voters the choice to reserve lottery funds for the Hope Scholarship and Pre-K. Senator Ed Tarver's amendment to the bill, which makes it harder for students to lose their book allowances and activity fees, also passed this afternoon. We're just very excited about the, the opportunity to, to get the Hope Chest Constitutional Amendment passed. Uh, it's had a, a couple of other opportunities that have not been successful. Uh, this year in the Senate, there's been a very bipartisan tone, which I think was very beneficial to us getting this passed. Uh, the amendment offered by Senator Tarver and others as it addresses the trigger language was, was key to being able to get the, the measure passed. Um, I don't know those against, but I know we had 45 votes in, in favor of the the, the legislation, and uh, we're, we're just really, really glad that we were able to get it out and look forward to what the House is going to do with it. However, the bill's opponents are concerned that the governor's Hope Chest Amendment will block necessary access to technical schools. We have shut down access of the people of Georgia to return for retraining when they have a change in their job through no fault of their own in many, many cases. When, a, when, a, when, a, when, the, when this Hapeville plant and this Doraville plant, these auto, auto maker plants shut down in Georgia, you're going to have an array of people who are going to need retraining. But maybe they already went in and got trained in tool and dye. Maybe they already went in and got trained in, in metal painting. They, they, they do not have access. Two of the governor's other measures failed to make it onto the calendar of the House or the Senate today. One, House Bill 195 would give income tax breaks to the retired. Majority Leader Jerry Keene says House leadership is holding it until next year when they will consider it as part of a broader tax reform package. We have several tax ideas also. Speaker Pro Tem, for example, introduced a bill uh, to eliminate the car tax or ad valorem tax on all Georgians. Uh, the Speaker of the House has a tax idea. I introduced an idea to do away with the state income tax. So we thought the best course of action was to take all those good ideas, and each one of them uh, in their own it, are, are good or is good. But we wanted to make sure we come up with the best answer. And there simply was not enough time during the session to address all the other legislative needs and come out with a comprehensive proposal. The other piece of the governor's legislation that failed to make it on the calendar today, Senate Resolution 345, would allow religious institutions that provide social services to compete for state funds. Senator Don Balfour told me that the measure was too controversial and there was not enough time this session to gain support needed to pass the legislation. It can still come back next year, however. Reporting live from the Capitol, I'm Bridget Snap for Lawmakers. Thank you, Bridget. A bill that redefines and expands the scope of practice for chiropractors passed the Senate today. Senator Don Balfour sponsors Senate Bill 102 and took the well to debunk what he calls myths about what this bill does. Let the chiropractors uh, do what they have been doing, what they need to be doing, um, and uh, I think it will help uh, 
of the citizens of the state of Georgia. There's uh, some folks that are talking about uh, what I will call myths that this will raise cost of health care, and I, don't, I do not believe this is true. Someone actually sat down in, in one of the meetings and said the chiropractors under this could perform surgery. I mean, that, I don't know where they're getting that from. I mean, Don Quixote thought those windmills were dragons, and I guess that's his right to do so, but uh, those are still windmills and not dragons. And um, there, there's, there was a referral that this would increase Medicaid costs. Medicaid doesn't even cover chiropractic services, and so I don't, I'm trying to figure out how that would raise the Medicaid costs when chiropractic services aren't even included under Medicaid. Two amendments from Senator Preston Smith, which required doctor referrals for certain examinations, failed. The final floor vote on Senate Bill 102 was 40 to 12, and it now goes to the House. The House today, meanwhile, voted to change the rules for child custody proceedings. House Bill 369 pro provides the right of direct appeal in custody hearings, gives judges 17 factors to use in determining the best interests of the child, compels parents to develop a shared parenting plan, and revises the rules by which teenagers may influence their own living situations. In Georgia, as it presently stands, children 14 or older can decide which child to well, which parent to live with, sometimes they seem like children in custody battles, which parent to live with, and that decision can only be overturned if the parent is determined to be unfit. And under present Georgia law, the, parent, the number of times the child can make an election is unlimited. In other words, it can, it can become a revolving door. We have attempted to fix the abuses of this system by changing the standard for review by the courts so that the child, if the child makes a selection, and the court determines that it's not in the child's best interest, the court can overturn that. House Bill 369 passed by a vote of 165 to 2. The House also voted to charge fees to both payees and recipients for the collection of child support. Representative Wendell Willard told the House that the Federal Deficit Reduction Act forces the state to find ways to offset these costs. It works out, if you read the bill, to a sum of $13 <coughs> yearly to be paid in 12 installments, which means as monthly payments come in and monthly payments go out, <coughs> there will be one dollar charge of the obligor, which is the payor on the one side, and also a dollar on the receiver of the funds on the opposite side to make up what is a deficit we have to account for if we don't do it of about twenty, uh, twenty-five dollars per year on each of these particular type of child support collections. So I say the problem is if we don't have uh, this means of doing it, because of the Deficit Reduction Act, we are going to have a cost to the state of over $4 million. House Bill 156 passed 140 to 16. It moves to the Senate. In addition to the 68 bills on the general calendar today, the Senate debated and eventually passed two bills on the local consent calendar. They began with Senate Bill 306, which changes the duties and functions of the Greater Fulton Water Authority. Senator David Schaefer sponsors the legislation. What we're trying to do in Fulton County Right now, the city of Atlanta has its own water system. It serves the city of Atlanta and some parts of unincorporated, um, or, or some parts of Fulton County outside the city of Atlanta. And the rest of uh, the county is served by the Fulton County Water Department. The rates for those ratepayers are set by a board of commissioners that's composed of a majority of people who don't represent those water customers. And so all we're attempting to do is set up an authority that moves the governance of the water system into the, into the elected officials who most closely represent the, uh, the customers who pay the bills. Senator Horacina Tate originally signed on to Senate Bill 306, but took the well today to explain why she wants her name taken off. I took my name off of the bill, or tried to, and found out that I couldn't. And I think we just need to take a moment to slow this process down and look at something that is going to hurt, potentially hurt, the county and the city. Let's not go home from here to wake up to tomorrow's headlines that, that the Georgia Senate willy-nilly took apart an apparatus that's been in place for 100 years for Fulton and Atlanta governments to provide sewage and water services to this area. Now, legislation that would repeal the review of a three-judge panel for those sentenced to prison terms of more than 12 years. Representative Barry Fleming was questioned about whether this would abolish the potential to change a sentence. 
they can appeal it through the appellate courts just like we have now. But the point is, you said there'll be no review. The victims of crimes have no ability to go before this panel. The DAs have no ability to go before this panel other than a written notice, if they're given notice that they're going to review a case, which is another problem that's existing that doesn't already happen. Cases are reviewed on appeal for their legal merits, and cases can be overturned, but sentences are not reduced by the Court of Appeals or the Georgia Supreme Court. Only the sentence review panel has the authority to reduce a sentence. As for the parole board, yes, the parole board looks at uh, a person's record and determines whether they should be released early on parole, subject to the time served requirements that we already have in place for the parole board. But they don't have the authority to reduce a sentence. House Bill 197 passed 102 to 62. It now moves to the Senate. Governor Sonny Perdue welcomed the NCAA to Georgia today. As most of you probably already know, Atlanta will be hosting the Final Four playoffs starting this Saturday. This is the third time Atlanta has hosted the event. Governor Perdue even took a minute to play a little basketball himself. So huge, not only fun, not only excitement, but a great economic impact, as you know, for our state and our city. And once again, uh, we want to demonstrate that uh, this city and this state's capable of, uh, of putting on a world-class event like the Final Four. And um, they're not just giving a boost to the Georgia Dome, uh, our fine facility, but also to uh, uh, not the surrounding hotels, other hospitality, but uh, uh, again, many things, mortar, our restaurants, taxis, uh, shopping, and, uh, and seeing the sights and having us an opportunity to demonstrate uh, uh, real southern hospitality in a great, uh, great basketball town. So we want you to come for basketball and get hooked on our southern hospitality. Now, earlier you heard Representative Calvin Smyrie debating changes to the peach care program. Today he returned to the House chamber following a lengthy absence for surgery. He accepted his colleague's well wishes with a tongue-in-cheek reference to changes that have occurred since Republicans took control of the House. That's a lot going on. When I saw that urgent attention required, <laughs> I thought you was going to appoint an escort committee. <laughs> I, I, I thought. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah, we I might thought, need to do I that. Thought, I, was like, I was going to say, let me be on the escort committee. I hadn't been on one this session. <laughs> in fact, I hadn't been on one in three years. <laughs> you know how to fix that, don't yeah, you? <laughs> uh, I remember when I can just say I want to be on the escort committee. Hey, okay, you're on the escort committee, but times do change. You know. Coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, light calendars are expected in both chambers after what is expected to be a marathon night tonight. We'll have highlights of that continued action as well as all the latest from under the Gold Dome tomorrow night at 7. If you have missed any part of this Lawmakers broadcast, tune in tomorrow morning when Lawmakers repeats at 5.30 a.m. Now stay tuned for Wild Chronicles. Tonight's episode, Mountain Lions, Tiger Sharks, and Bluefin Tuna. Wild Chronicles is coming up next here on GPB. And that's our broadcast for the 30th legislative day of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm in Wandy Lawson. And I'm David Zelski. Thanks for joining us. We'll leave you with a little footage from the House. Good evening. This has been a production of Georgia Public Broadcasting.